Welcome to the Listen, Learn, and Lead series of interviews of extraordinary leaders here at Naval Post Graduate School. Today I have the honor and the privilege of interviewing Dr. Gail Thomas, Associate Professor of Managerial Communication in the Graduate School of Defense Management. And she is a Program Manager of Strategic Communication at the Center for Executive Education here at NPS. Gail received her doctorate in business education at Arizona State University in Tempe, Arizona quite a while ago, and she's been with NPS for over 30 years. She's been the recipient of a number of awards, most recently in 2019, the Association Business Communication Impact Award sponsored by the University of Southern California Marshall School of Business. This award is based on the number of citations used in scholarly journals, so her work is well studied and well known and utilized throughout the entire business communication world. She also, of course, is the recipient of the Robert W. Hemming Inter Interdisciplinary Research Award back in 2006 for her ongoing studies focused on the development of interagency collaboration for homeland defense security. Gail, welcome. It's very nice to have you here. It's quite the background and certainly many other, other things that have contributed to your leadership in this area of work. Tell us a bit about yourself and how you got into this area. Thank you for inviting me today. I thought a lot about your theme, Listen, Learn, and Lead, and I think it really exemplifies why I came here and why I stay here. I, when I first got here and I first interviewed, one of the things I realized was this place was about applied research and teaching graduate stu students. At Arizona State, I had taught uh, rooms of 500 undergraduate students, I had taught master's students, and I taught PhD students. And I felt my passion was really working with practicing managers and leaders. And so to come to a place where I would get to work 24-7 out in the field with people and their challenges in the Navy and then bring that back to the classroom and then that provide information for me to write my research. Um, I haven't been more pleased or felt more honored than to be here at Naval Pulse Graduate School. Well, you've had just an extraordinary impact across the Navy and the nation. But one of the things that, that strikes me when I read about your work and I read about all of the other kinds of literature within your area is that there actually is not a clear sense about what, what strategic communication is. Could you, could you talk about that, please? Sure. So strategic communication, that actually um, started to be an interest of mine a few years after I got here when I was working with an admiral. And he had me going out into the field and uh, working on that. Start. I learned early on that uh, Mr. Rumsfeld was asking senior leaders for uh, strategic communication plans. And as many of you might know, he was a person who um, uh, was very adamant about what he wanted, and it was clear that many of the people who were presenting those plans to him weren't satisfying him. So I got a call and I was asked, could I help uh, Department of Defense in uh, uh, helping them develop strategic communication plans? Um, the idea is around, can we take a strategic issue and can we think around the communication strategy that would be part of making that issue actually be executed well? I would argue that a lot of times what we do is we start with a strategy or we start with an issue and come up with that plan, but we never think about, which I think is 80% of actually execution, is the communication piece of it. So for strategic communication, we're interested in what's the issue, who are all of the stakeholders who are going to be important for executing that, whether it's inside an organization or in operational issues. It could be adversaries. It could be allies. Um, it could be the American public. And what is, is going to be our strategy for communicating? And I would argue too many times we don't think through that piece. So one of the things that you're talking about is that you talked about uh, Mr. Rumsfeld as, as a Secretary of Defense and Admirals. Uh, and senior leaders in this whole business of thinking about, about communication in a, in a strategic way. But I was in one of your classes last week, and in that class it was mid-level managers and, 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 and leaders 
who were also very focused on this. So what is it about senior leaders and NCOs and mid-level civilian managers that they can all have an impact on strategic communication? Yeah, one of the one of a uh, interview I think that Admiral Ruffhead gave quite a while ago was he talked about um, we are leaders of communicators, which to me, especially in today's world, we are all communicators in our organization. So this is not something just for the communication professionals. It's every person in the organization who is communicating every day, whether internally or to people outside our organization. And those things become who we are as an organization. So for the strategic communication workshop, the way that's set up um, here at the Center of Executive Ed is that we have teams of people who bring an initiative to the workshop. So for example, we may have, uh, this has happened often, is two communities who are going to merge into one organization. That's a huge deal. And as we know in the private sector, many times that fails. And so we really have to think about what do those communities bring how is that going to be merged? And one of the things I've learned is how do we make sure that those professionals don't learn, lose their identities in the merger? And so for the leadership team to really understand deeply about what a merger means and how language is really going to matter in their success of that merger um, is really good food for thought and good ways for the leadership team, which includes a large number of people, whether it be senior leaders, like you said, NCOs, um, various operational uh, uh, positions to get together to try to figure out what's the best way to make this go forward. So you're talking about language and culture and context and just people and, and, and their identity. Those are hard things to bring together if you're merging or if you're actually also separating in some That's cases right. where you're going to also uh, do a break apart. Tell, tell me what are some of the principles that you use that help that kind of work come along in the strategic communication area? So um, some people don't realize that there is a science to communication. Um, it's been studied for many, many years, so we have lots of research that we can rely on around change management. We know there are certain ways that change is more successful, ways that change is least successful, so we draw on those principles. There's a uh, a lot of work on persuasion and influence, so how is it that we best get buy-in from a group? How do we use their ideas um, in a way to make an issue go forward? So um, um, lots of science that we can use to make this work a lot better than, uh, what I say uh, oftentimes, we try to do it by common sense, and unfortunately common sense is often the opposite of what we really need to do. So we need to know um, what is it from the sciences there? How can we lean on that, lean on data to do a better job? I know that you're very conscious about not talking about current projects because of a sense of confidentiality uh, and of discretion. But can you tell a story about what you knew from the past that was just this great aha moment that was very successful in its impact? Yeah, one of the things uh, that we did a couple of years ago with was uh, with NAS Fallon. So probably many of the people listening know and that NAS is Naval Air Station okay. Fallon. Um, they are in the midst of procuring 200,000 acres um, as a way to modernize that base. It will be the largest land acquisition the Navy's made since World War II. Um, it's I, I didn't realize until a few years ago, I should have understood, this should have been an aha for me, is how much the Navy is involved with environmental issues. Mm -hmm. Almost everything we do has an environmental component, whether it's exercises at sea, uh, this expansion, all those kinds of things. And so the environmental piece of it means that we have to engage with a large number of stakeholders in order for us to reach our desired effect. In this case, we'd like to successfully get this land acquisition so that Top Gun and Navy SEAL exercises can go about unimpeded. But if you look at, a team came here to work on this strategic communication. And when we listed the number of stakeholders on the board, there were probably at least 100. I mean, you can think of miners, ranchers, Congress people, community members, who um, some people are supportive, a lot of people not so much supportive. And so really understanding, and that's where strategic communication is important, is two-way. You have to listen, right? You have to listen, you have to learn, 
What is the concern that those particular stakeholders have? Um, do we need to make adjustments in order to make this a more collaborative effort so that it's good for the, can't just be good for the Navy, it has to be good for the community. So how do we involve in that collaborative kind of experience so that it's best for the nation and national security? So what do you find uh, are some of the common faults, the common mistakes uh, that various organizations or people make when it comes to this kind of work? So a uh, very common one I see all the time is uh, senior leaders who come up with a strategy and think that they can uh, create a fancy brochure, hand out the brochure, and the change is going to happen. Um, I have never seen that work well. Um, so really understanding how people are going to be impacted by that change. Hopefully that research has been done ahead of time. Um, I can give you lots of examples. Uh, let's see, the um, uh, Navy uniforms, changes in uniforms has been a good example. Uh, the ratings change that the Navy proposed. I mean, how many examples do we have where we, we kind of had an aha moment when we went to announce the change? So um, that kind of thinking rarely goes well. So really understanding the principles of figuring out who's going to be impacted by this, when and where do we engage, how do we gather that information, and how do we create strategies to communicate to have a successful um, end to what we're trying to do. So you've been doing this for a long time here at NPS, and one of the great partners in this endeavor has been the University of Southern California. Talk about how we entered, that in, uh, entered into that partnership and what it has meant to NPS and this whole notion of strategic communication uh, education. Right. So um, that's another way, I think, a theme for me of how I learn and how I um, hope I help NPS become a better place is building a network. Um, when we first started these workshops, I was um, given the opportunity to look across the nation and figure out who might be partners in being able to help stand up this endeavor. Um, I met the people from uh, University of Southern California one of the things they bring to the party is a large uh, repertoire of communication disciplines um, in political communication, in organizational communication, um, and uh, persuasion, influence. And so I have learned from them as they have learned from us um, over these many years that we've had this partnership. And, when, and if they were asked separately, so how is this going with NPS and what are your major impressions? What would USC say? That I have heard them say many times to me and other people how much they have truly appreciated this partnership that we've had. Um, to be frank, um, I think they were uh, not sure how it was going to go working with the military when they first came. Um, we all went out on a uh, carrier landing and learned behind the scenes uh, what Navy really does and what from the most junior uh, enlisted to the commander of the ship, what that looked like. And from that day on, they have been uh, all on board and really appreciating the hard work and, uh, that the Navy does. That's a nice segue to my next question, is that you have a lot of students and you deal with a lot of military students. What is it that, that brings something different to that? What, what, what's different about them as your students uh, rather than some other profession perhaps, or uh, what is it that they bring to the, to the table? So what I really like, and I learned this at ASU, I like experienced managers and leaders because they bring so much experiential knowledge to the table. And so I'm learning as much from them as I hope that they learn from me. And then by all of the experience I have in the field, I'm able to bring some of those challenges to the classroom and to throw those challenges to them and get them thinking about that and have them come up with their own good ideas based on what we know from the science so they can take that back out to the field and be better leaders. Well, I want to say, oh, by the way, that you've been a great help to me because when I got here to NPS, I recognized the need for some strategic communication and, uh, and you were very helpful to me also as I tried to, to, to have us and the globe really understand what we do, so that's been great. What have I not asked you for a story or impact that you would like to, to, to tell me about that would be of interest to our audience? So uh, I guess in thinking about today, I, you know, I realize, and I say this all the time, 
NPS is such a gold mine. There are so many ways, interdisciplinary ways, that we bring to the table that um, can help the Navy and ways that we learn from each other. So I want to give you just a couple of examples of that. So um, I work all across campus. I think I've been here so long. Um, I just get to know people and I'm curious. I want to know what are the people in OR doing that might overlap with what I'm doing. So I have worked for many years with Jeff Klein over in operations research. Um, I was recently asked by uh, my colleague at USC to write a chapter in a book on strategic communication in North Korea. So I thought, huh, that sounds interesting, but you know, where can I learn more in order to be able to bring my subject matter expertise? And I thought, Jeff Klein. Jeff and I have been working together a lot. I've been wanting to know more about campaign planning. What a better way for me to learn about campaign planning North Korea and write a chapter for this book. <laughs> that's right, that's right. And that's right. so um, I suppose it was a selfish in my mind. I actually got something out of and I was able to uh, have regular meetings with Jeff so we could talk about this topic. Um, another one was you mentioned earlier the interagency collaboration. Yeah. So when the Homeland Security program first stood up their master's degree, they had research that was research money available. And I had a couple of colleagues who had been wanting to study this. So we got the funding and we were able to develop a diagnostic model that we have now used in multiple countries around the world. There's a program in defense analysis where we work on maritime security and border security where we bring our allies from other countries here. And we've actually gone to Morocco and other countries to um, teach and learn around interagency collaboration on a number of different security topics. So, to me, there is no end to the knowledge that I'm able to mine here. To, and I think that's where we uh, will shine in the future. It's taking the knowledge we have here and recombining it in ways to meet new emerging problems. And so I don't think we even know as NPS, much less what other people know about us, of how much there is still to mine uh, from this gold. Do you have some stories of some senior leaders with whom you've worked who came to you and asking you how they could improve in their strategic communications efforts and their commands? Yeah, here at the Center for Executive Ed, you know, we do executive coaching and I do particularly in strategic communication. So I've coached over 100 flag officers um, since I've been here working in the center. And one of my favorite experiences, I think, was um, it was a coaching experience, but I would say I probably uh, learned as much from him as um, I, you know, taught him something, was Admiral Fogo. And in fact, we use a reading in our strategic communication workshop that he and Lieutenant Cole wrote a few years ago about, um, called, it's not, it's not your father's ball tops. And it was about um, the Baltic operations exercises. And he in the Navy is one of the people I think is an exemplar who really understands the essence of strategic communication. He, like me, I think thinks of, you know, the Navy actually, we are all about communication. So when we do an exercise in the ball tops, or I was just reading CNO notes about uh, exercises in the Arctic, right? Everything we say and do is meant to send a message. The number of ships that are involved in the exercises, um, what countries are involved in the exercises, what exercises we do is meant to send a message to our adversaries, to our allies, and to the American public. And so thinking up front, before we even start the operational planning, what is the message that we are hoping to send and how do we plan the operations in such a way that we might send that message and then ultimately at the end of the day, it doesn't matter what we intended the message to be, what was the message that was received or perceived from all of those different stakeholders? And how do we learn that and then what do we do with that learning? So in your work with senior leaders, uh, there is certainly a different dynamic to crisis communications and then to anticipatory right. um, communications to get things done. Do you, have, do you have a sense about that with, with senior leaders and any experiences with that to share with us? Yeah, so again, that's another area I work with uh, Jeff Klein in thinking about risk mitigation. And so I think of strategic communication is risk mitigation. How can we anticipate, and we can do that with data, we can do that in a number of different ways and anticipating risks that might be coming our ways. And then how do we 
what I do is hope to communicate in such a way to avoid the crisis. I always say it's going, you know, something's going to take you this long. It's going to take, a lot of people don't want to do the work up front for strategic communication. I say do it now, do it early, and perhaps not get in that crisis situation, or go your merry way, be in that crisis, and you're not going to like that situation that you're going to have to deal with. So let's try to mitigate it. Let's think about all of the people who will be involved and how can we use strategic communication to mitigate crisis. Do you have a good story that would be uh, one of our senior leaders with whom you worked in a crisis environment that worked out quite well? So I can think of a situation and uh, some of these, you know, I can't name names or right. name right. the sure. situation, but we had a commander of a large carrier who had a crisis situation and he needed to um, change that situation from one that wasn't going so well to one that uh, would be better for the future. So by bringing a team here, uh, we worked on that and he was able to uh, really turn that around and make that a much better situation for himself. So that was an operational problem Correct. that was able then to be coached and managed and then to a, a good end. So there's always time, there's always an opportunity to make this better. That's right. That's great. So my final question then is a wonderful um, compilation of all of your comments. If a student were to come up to you and say, Gail and Dr. Thomas, what is your theory about leadership and, and, and can you tell me what leadership is to you? Yep. So to me, leadership is, it's not leader as a person. Leadership is a system that includes a leader it includes a follower and it includes the context. And um, it reminds me of, so early on we developed uh, the company officer program at the Naval Academy. Sure, yeah, yeah. And as you know, my background in education, I actually created a course there in um, what is leadership development look like at the Naval Academy. Right. So taking all we know about leadership, um, whether it's uh, Piaget's theory of learning, uh, moral development, uh, ethical development, psychological development. Um, that idea of leadership is really knowing who your people are, what gifts do they bring to your organization, um, where's their passion, right? And then what is it that our organization can bring to, in this case, to Navy challenges? And how do we release that passion? So that's it's leadership in all of us. How do we co-develop ourselves and our organization to be the best we can possibly be? And to me, that's leadership. Well, that's marvelous. And I tell you is that all of your time here at NPS as a teacher, as a leader, as a friend, as a coach, uh, and somebody who has had an impact, uh, I just want to thank you very much for your commitment to NPS, to our students, to actually the health and well-being of our military and of our nation in having people be able to be more effective at how they talk to each other and how they do things as they communicate. And really want to thank you for your time today, but most importantly for the extraordinary difference that you make every day as a leader here on this campus. We're very happy to have had Dr. Gail Thomas as our interviewee and one of our great and extraordinary leaders here at NPS. Thank you, Gail, very much. Thank you.